and it is my tremendous pleasure tonight to introduce to you Indra Park Gray Wall, who is a professor and chair in the program in women's gender and sexuality studies at Yale University. Uh, she's also a professor in the Ethnicity, Race, and Migration Studies program, the South Asian Studies Council, and affiliate faculty in the American Studies program. She is the author of Home and Harem, Nation, Gender, Empire, and the Cultures of Travel, published by Duke University Press in 96, Transnational America, Feminisms, Diasporas, and Neoliberalisms, also published by Duke in 2005, and Saving the Security State, Exceptional Citizens in, the, in 21st Century America, also published by Duke in 2017. With Karen Kaplan, she has written and edited Gender in the Transnational World, Introduction to Women's Studies, published in 2001 and, and reissued in 2005, and Scattered Hegemonies, Postmodernity and Transnational Feminist Practices, uh, published by University of Minnesota Press in 1994. And with Victoria Bernal, she has edited Theorizing NGOs, States, Feminism, and Neoliberalism, also published by Duke in 2014. It is absolutely my tremendous pleasure to welcome Andrew Powell to the podium. Please help me welcome her. Many thanks to you all for being here on this evening. And my thanks to Professor Majid for inviting me, for Lucille and Daniel Shaw for organizing my trip. And I want to congratulate the university and Professor Majid and the president on the 10th anniversary of the Center for Global Humanities. It is a tremendous achievement and so exciting to have such an institution here uh, and to think about humanities as a global enterprise. So um, let me uh, share with you a little bit of my thoughts about the global politics of gender today. And I am a scholar of empires. I began my career studying the British Empire, and I moved on to study the American Empire. So think about American and British Empire from the viewpoint of what's called post-colonial studies, the studies of thinking about empire as a sort of the kind of uh, cultural encounters that were, um, uh, that had all kinds of effects, many of them very negative, uh, and, and which are very complicated and when, which continue on into the present as I will talk about today. So I'll talk today about how histories of colonialism, these history of, of European and American empire, remain central to understanding what we call the global politics of gender. There's evidence of that, those histories and its continuities in the figures of many, many uh, aspects of the news that you hear today. And I'll just flag one that just happened just this past week about this US missionary killed on Sentinel Island in November who was trying to convert this um, this um, people who had lived in this particular island in the Indian Ocean for many centuries and felt that he needed to go there and convert them. And this island is, um, has people who have not had any contact with modernity or, or hadn't have been protected from that. So they kill anybody who comes to it. But he went to that place. And of course, you can understand, as you know, the kinds of dangers that come with bringing a foreign body into a place like that and the effects that it would have on that particular community. So in fact, the, the kind of narration of this encounter is a complicated one and one that harkens back to the histories that I want to recall today. Right. And that's one story that resonates with that history of, of colonialism and empire. Another one is that Hillary Clinton said Europe needs to curb migration to counter nationalism. And she said this in, in a very well-meaning uh, way. In an interview with the Guardian newspaper, she said that European leaders like uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel said, uh, needed to deal with the immigration problem. She said, I admire the very generous and compassionate approaches that were taken particularly by leaders like Angela Merkel, but I think it is fair to say Europe has done its part and must send a very clear message. We are not going to be able to continue to provide refuge and support because if you don't deal with the migration issue, it will continue to roil the body politic. 
And of course, there's some truth to that. But one has to understand where that language comes from, what it is to say to people, you cannot move, you cannot travel, you cannot live in the places of Europe, especially after histories of colonialism, where Europeans did go to their countries and exploit those countries. So this is a, this is a complicated issue that we have uh, with us today. Right. So I want to throw up these two ish news items to relate to much of what I'll be talking about today to understand the global politics of gender and which, in which empire, race, questions of development um, are very critical. Right, And I, I'll be happy to talk about the Clinton and the John Chow issue after in q and uh, if people are interested. But it's not what I'm going to talk about in the body major part of my lecture today. So my lecture has three parts, right? One, I'm going to talk about tracing shifts in development, especially with attention to gender as it concerns women, because gender is a broad category. But often in development work, when we say gender, we often just meet women, right? Um, the second I will talk about is the emergence of the security state and the securitization of gender, why I think that questions of security and securitization are important for us to deal with. And three, the kind of the, the emergence of US as a kind of declining empire that we can only understood through the kinds of ways in which we think about imperialism and colonialism and why empires rise and fall and decline. Right. In the first part, I focus on how gender is incorporated into development via the construct of the brown or black woman of the global south who is a victim of her culture and why development has come under critique by many post-colonial feminist scholars. So there's tremendous critique of uh, this kind of development. In the second uh, part of, the, uh, of my lecture, I discuss a recent book that I published that uh, Anwar mentioned, uh, Saving the Security State and how security is manifested in our everyday lives in the United States, how it's both a domestic and an international form of power and governance that we, we experience every day. Right. In the final section of my, letter, my lecture, I will suggest the need to bring together these analyses that came from understanding colonialism as it was manifested in the global south, to bring that back to understanding our president, Donald Trump, and several other celebrities today. So I want to sort of reverse the gaze a little bit here in the third part of my lecture. So let me begin with development. Late 20th century global projects of development focused on the empowerment of women and on the uplift of women through poverty reduction and education and a lot of reproductive care work. Many of these were unable to shed the histories of empire race, teleological concepts of Western modernity, and ideologies of civilizational difference that have long viewed the women from the global south as projects and targets of development. They cannot develop themselves, they need to be developed. Today we face many different and related challenges that we have to talk about too. So development is now only one of the many challenges that we face globally today, right? Development began, and um, many of you know this, in the post-World War II for the major part, and has continued into the present and undergone many different phases that you must also be familiar with. So one must not forget that development emerged much after the massive outflow of resources from the global south because of Western colonization, over trillions of dollars, as some economists argue, in today's money to the north. In the case of South Asia, where I come from, for instance, the British left India in 1947 in shambles. You must have heard of the violence of the partition. After using both its food supplies, which led to a massive famine in Bengal, where millions of people died, and it also used Indian soldiers to fight both its world wars. In 1919, as Shashi Tharoor has pointed out, rather than the English civilizing the Indians, they were impoverishing and destroying them. Life expectancy at independence in 1947, after 100 years of British rule, was 32 years. After independence, it rose to 65 years by 2012. Right? So we have to, 
reckon with this kind of uh, colonial exploitation. And the case of Haiti is also well known, where they had to pay compensation to the French for leaving, right? And we know what Haiti has experienced after that. Development has been part of this history, despite its well-meaning adherence and its intermittent logic of a kind of repair of the global south. It has also become a means to continue European and American uh, power in a post-colonial era. After World War II and the making of the Bretton Woods institutions, development focused on first the big projects of dams, industrialization, projects that have now led to many ecological problems. Modernization theory was the logic of this kind, this phase of development right after the Second World War. It was only towards the end of the 20th century, after several decades of this kind of development, that there was focused attention to gender and to women, right? After many years, then these World Bank and all these institutions are starting to say, well, we need to pay attention to what's happening to women and the families. So it was only towards the end of the 20th century that there was focused attention to gender and women, whose, and the logic was we need to empower them so that if there is change in the lives of women, there will be change in the, in the family as well, right? So, and change in the family would then supposedly lead to changing in the so-called traditional cultures, right? And that empowerment was to lead to widespread reform of cultures that were believed to be more patriarchal and more traditional than the West. How to change tradition to modernity was the issue. And you can see numerous books and articles written by lots and lots of people who thought about the kind of difference between modernity and tradition, how traditional cultures were different from modern cultures, and what constituted that great difference and divergence, right? Here's another one. So all of these books and articles and research was done around these questions of tradition and the difference between tradition and modernity. Um, as Chandra Mohanty has argued, this form of development also included creating the figure of the third world woman as a victim of her patriarchal culture and who was considered to be very unfree compared to her Western counterparts. Feminist theorists saw patriarchy itself as a phenomena of the global south for the most part, and many argued that patriarchy should be understood as a concept marked by the rule of a father in a traditional family, one that Western modernity had overcome. Postcolonial feminist scholars and critical development scholars offer different viewpoints to this view. They focused, as one scholar, Preeti Ramamurthy states, um, that this kind of women in development approach, right, it's for shorthand is WID, um, produced liberal subjects who were supposed to be globalized. And it was another universalizing uh, rhetoric of making women the same all over the world, right? And there was a lot of opposition to this from Marxist viewpoints, from the people who looked at the ways in which structural adjustment programs were hurting women, and they wanted to produce alternatives to development, so Dawn was a big project on the producing of alternatives to development, right? So the post-development, this is what's called post-development thought, came to focus on precarity and the exclusion caused by globalization rather than seeing globalization as beneficial. Yet one might ask, what are the directions in which development has taken shape in the current era of neoliberalism and securitization, right, both in the North and the South. I would suggest there are two key paths for development that have emerged. One, the NGOization of development, especially with regard to women and gender concerns, and which has come under both critique and acclaim. And second, the securitization of development. And you can see that I wrote two books, one on each of these, uh, uh, these paths that I found really compelling to understand in kind of post, um, towards the end of the 20th century in the first part of the 21st. Right. In the former, in the theorizing NGOs, my 
colleague Victoria Bernal and I published research that illuminated the complex processes of NGOization. We didn't think that the world was becoming actually homogenized by NGOs promoting feminist development projects. We saw, found that some researchers found that some projects changed once they landed in some particular spaces and regions. Some had unexpected results. Some created new kinds of gendered of subjects, and some were replays of colonial projects, top-down kinds of projects. We argued that NGOs were the new face of development after the neoliberal turn away from state-sponsored massive development projects. Right? Many NGOs, especially the ones funded by northern governments and donors, continued the project of imperialism, yet they were also challenged in all kinds of ways. Right? I think, however, that development has now become intertwined with the project of national and state security in somewhat shifting ways in this new century. One can give an example of a current, a more recent book written by Alayla Abu Lugod, who has argued that the project of saving the Muslim women emerges in the context of a war on terror that targets Muslim societies as more patriarchal and Muslim women as more oppressed than any others. I've argued in another article that the concept of honor and honor societies is being used to describe predominantly Muslim communities in both the South and in the diaspora. Muslim women are homogenized as one undifferentiated group of persons, right? And their communities are often targeted and seen as threatening and the women needing to be rescued. Furthermore, another way of securitization is happening in regard to migration. So the logic of development is shifting to thinking about how to stop people from migrating, right? And the kinds of militarization and securitization, and my colleague Catherine Besteman writes and thinks brilliantly about this, um, that hopes to contain people in places where they have, to, they have to struggle to survive, right? And one that harkens back to Hillary Clinton's point, right? That migrants from Africa are a threat to Europe. Right. and that we need to keep them where they are and to create barriers to their mobility. As securitization emerges within the development, it is often also a project of women's empowerment, of saving them from their cultures and communities. It is in visible in terms such as security and securitization and in the kinds of logic of protection that has long been a part of gender uh, and governance everywhere in many parts of the world. The protection of women was also central to the racial history of the US as protection of white women became then the ways in which African American males, for instance, could become targets of lynching and violence. Right. Uh, so in the, I'm going to now move to the second part where I talk about security state and securitization. I want to look more closely at this kind of phenomena because we, we are immersed in the rhetoric and the, not, and, the, and the discourse and the governance of security. And these are really critical ways in which domestic and other spaces outside are changing with the kind of global project of countering uh, terrorism, for instance. So I argue, I think that with this kind of securitization, the welfare state is shifting in its projects and goals. As US citizens of many races strive to reach the goals of becoming citizens, and you can see my first image of John Chow, who's an Asian American, evangelical American, evangelical, trying to save these tribal others in some kind of way. Um, as these citizens of many races strive to reach the goals of becoming citizens in this empire, they become the agents of state security and also they become humanitarians. He's a missionary after all. Those who have now are now slowly taking over development as an individual project. And, and we can we also know the ways in which social entrepreneurship has emerged as another kind of project. So we are all asked to participate in this project of security. And if you, you know, if you see something, say something is ubiquitous, 
everywhere. We've all seen this, the ways in which when you go through TSA, it's becoming so normalized to, 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 to obediently take off your shoes, take off everything from your bag. So it's a, it's a very, di and you know, as I grow older, I have to remind students, there was a time when we would just get on the plane, that families could come to the gate and say goodbye. And that's something nobody can even reckon with because it's so far from their experience in their lives. So our students live in such a different kind of securitized world. Right? Um, so this kind of, if you see something, say something is ubiquitous, right? Um, you also see a signs to enjoining people to save other people. If you see a girl who could do anything, he sees a girl he can force to do anything. This is an anti-trafficking poster found by a colleague of mine at a rest stop in Tennessee. So it's really interesting to see how these kinds of posters and images are circulating and asking us to speak up and to patrol and to, to see something and say something. Um, and we see this uh, also in the very figures of people who will call the police, uh, predominantly on African American uh, of children, even, and members of communities, right? So how might we theorize a state that has this Tennessee state sign? How do we think about this state, right? On the one hand, it says, if you see something, say something. On the other hand, it says, well, if you see somebody being trafficked, you need to save that person, and you need to say something. So the save something is also for the security state, but it's also for a humanitarian purpose, right? So it's both these ways of thinking about security and, and saying something. Uh, these two seemingly divergent modes of participation reveal the intertwining and co-construction of citizens of both welfare and militarism in the context of American empire. So our, our sort of the ideas of looking out for each other is becoming transformed into something else. What I call in my book, I call this an advanced phase of neoliberalism is made visible in, in this moment of the waning power of the US empire. And these, and so we, we see in this moment so many insecurities of people that are propelling them to participate in both surveillance and of different kinds, right? The neoliberal project then has shifted to a form of exceptional citizenship that is insecure and anxious. It's connected to a history of imperialism through racial white supremacy movements, discrimination towards migrants, especially of color, Africans and Muslims predominantly, and the consolidation of racial patriarchal culture. In the case of the US, I see this through particular historical specificity, visible in the divergent ways that people, all of us actually, respond to these conditions to become citizens and to agree to taking more protection and securitization and giving up many of our rights, right? The kind of logic is also give up your rights for better protection. Some of the subjects of this advanced neoliberalism that I studied include the parent who privatizes state security within the middle class, normatively white, and heteronormative family through parental and community surveillance. So this is the social entrepreneur who's, you know, I found this um, on, you know, just doing Google image searches, and it was really interesting to see how this emerging form is also considered a white male endeavor. I was very struck by that. Uh, so interesting. Um, but the kinds of ways in which it is becoming incorporated, I think, in interesting ways into the work of everyday life, into all our job places, in our workplaces, but also in the ways in which we need to support <coughs> our school teachers by giving them uh, you know, some dollars towards buying pencils and books that the state ought to buy for them. So we are doing our work participates in this kind of uh, entrepreneurship, and that is sort of part of what is called is the new humanitarianism. So this kind of, along with that, we see this sort of parenting. Uh, uh, you know, we think of helicopter parents. I think of securitizing parents, right, where you have uh, uh, 
you know, your cell phones given to your children can become tethers, can become fences. You, they can, you know every moment where they are. I know parents who do this. Uh, they can trace where their children, their teenagers are. Uh, there are. There's software that will tell you if they're driving too fast in a car or what their speed is in a car. There's lots and lots of software sold to parents to make them feel that their children are more and more secure. Right? Um, so this kind of notion of parental and community surveillance is really interesting because on the, one can also see the ways in which uh, black children, males for instance, are terribly insecure, not because of this kind of securitization, but precisely because the security forces make them insecure. The police makes them insecure too, right? And this is Michelle Malkin who says, who is, for me, a very iconic figure of someone who's really be trying to become this exceptional citizen, is what our country deserves from everyone, is a little more gratitude and a lot less greed, right? And she wants a more uh, a security state, a more masculine, protective state, and will give up all her rights for that. Um, so, we see this, in, and she's one of the figures that I'm very fascinated by uh, in my research, the kind of parental, but also this kind of feminism. She's very empowered. She's a strong woman who's on television. And there are many like her, too. right? And there are others who become humanitarians, the kind of ubiquitous image of humanitarianism you see is the kind of white humanitarian, and you know who that is, surrounded by brown and black people who are the recipients of this. So you're not looking at this image and saying, oh, well, I don't quite know who the humanitarian is here. Yeah. Uh, you know right away who's, who it is. Right. Um, so the humanitarian who makes, and I find this kind of humanitarianism that's seeping into development really, really important, and it individualizes development in interesting ways. But humanitarian also makes decisions and individual and consumer choices, if you know kiva.org or donors choose, or all of these different sites that allow you to give as whatever you think worthy. It's not that we collectively democratically through our representatives decide what welfare should be, right? Because we think that they have given up that task. We make decisions according to our desires and wishes, right? So this kind of uh, individual and consumer choice has become more and more powerful about who decides who it is. You know, students are made to go on trips to all over uh, the world to do this. I, uh, at Yale, I have many students who will come to me and say, I'm going to Africa, I'm going such place, I'm going to do, you know, work in an NGO. And I always say, have you taken a course on history on that place? And really, do you know the language? And quite often they don't. So the kind of ways in which work is done is really individualized in interesting ways. Here, of course, you know who this is. Um, the, and then we have not only these kinds of humanitarians, but also this, this kind of figure, the counterinsurgent feminist who is empowered, who can save the country because of her work, but she's also very tragic, very fraught, very has all kinds of problems in her life too. And I think about this in the way that um, securitization also pushes women to be empowered to take on the job, but they're never seen as quite up to the task, or they're destroyed by it in ways that their male counterparts are not. And then you have many of these, right? Um, and this is, much of this is Claire Danes. And this is Zero Dark Thirty, if any of you saw this, the killing of Osama bin Laden. This is kind of a quintessential figure of the tragic woman who saves the nation, but is herself a sad and lonely person. Um, and then you have the shooters, the man to whom the US has dispersed its sovereignty. And I think about why we don't do anything in the US to stop this kind of carnage. These figures are ubiquitous. And there's a long American history to why we call this person a shooter, too. We don't call him a terrorist uh, if he's not a Muslim or a brown person. We just say shooter. 
the shooter does. And it's such a euphemism um, to think about what is done under the name. But it, the shooter has an American history of gun cultures and manifest destiny in the West, and which is why that term is used. In proposing now, and you can see even the ways in which the securitization uses racial logics to create new algorithms of predictive, what's called predictive analytics, right? Um, uh, and some criminal codes are now, this was an interesting case that shows how two people are treated so differently through what some scholars are calling algorithmic racism. Uh, another image about how children are seen to be both uh, con to be controlled and also threatening. Uh, I find this an incredibly powerful image. It's an ad for a parental control software program. Right. Uh, so humanitarianism has now emerged as pervasive. Right. At its best, it can create publicity for causes and mobilize donations and sentiment. It often does so in ways that comes from histories of charity, religious giving, that are, that are pervasive in all kinds of religious communities and cultures, but also from the histories of colonialism and development. It emphasizes, for the most part, again, the racial difference and the economic difference between the person who is the humanitarian. And you notice that the word humanitarian refers to the person doing the humanitarian. It doesn't refer to the people he works with. Um, and it does so coming from these kinds of histories. So we see this sort of difference because now development, rather than these large projects, we see and money, more money funneled to NGOs, to individuals to do this kind of work. Humanitarianism often can justify accumulation of wealth and suggest that private charity can su supplant structural inequities and violence generated by histories of race or colonialism. And in the US, what, what is most troubling is that the practices of humanitarianism are replacing demands for rights and entitlements from the state. So humanitarian citizenship then removes those who cannot become humanitarian, often low-income people from such citizenship. And I'm always struck by asking students who have to do jobs um, uh, to support, to you know, and have to take loans for education, asked to volunteer that time free to corporations and companies. So another excellent example of this kind of humanitarianism is the New York Times. This is Greg Mortensen, who with his co-writer Oliver Rellin wrote this book called Three Cups of Tea, One Man's Mission to Promote Peace, One School at a Time, came out in 2006 and was a big bestseller. I came to know of it because in my children's school, uh, high school, the entire school was asked to read this book. It was the all school read for that one year. Uh, Greg this is an account of Greg Mortensen's efforts to establish girls schools in remote parts of Pakistan and Afghanistan, right? Mortensen's account of creating all these schools has since been attacked as a fabrication. John Krakow, or who you may have heard of, has uh, found, went to those places and found that most of the schools were actually not built and not functioning. And this NGO has lost some of its prominence and power. But the narrative remains powerful but because it belongs to a genre of imperial travel writing whose elements are understandable and familiar, widely disseminated and read. This is a travel narrative in which Western travelers go to unknown lands for adventures, become accepted by the locals, according to their accounts, as benevolent, and then emerge as saviors of, of native cultures. Right. What is not generally known is Mortensen's link with the US military in a region that has long been a war zone and his collaboration with General McChrystal during the invasion of Afghanistan after 9-11. Another example of humanitarianism you can see emerging after catastrophes in the US too, where the government often seems unable to or reluctant to do the work of rescue and fails in the work of reestablishing and resuscitating communities, leaving the job of development to private enterprises and individuals. 
and the anthropologist Vincent Adams has shown, for instance, how those impacted by Hurricane Katrina, predominantly those low income or racial minorities, were deprived of any support by a state that shed its welfare function onto for-profit businesses contracted to supply aid. We see the same occurring in Puerto Rico again. In New Orleans, for instance, African-American citizens were cons became outsiders when they were termed refugees by the press. And in Puerto Rico, President Trump has treated Puerto Ricans as non-citizens too. So they're expelled away from citizenship and denied the kinds of rights and entitlements to re rehabilitating and reestablishing their communities. U.S. humanitarianism is also coupled with surveillance in which the soft power of the U.S. is mobilized to produce American citizenship. So American humanitarian projects then reanimate and utilize what is presumed to be impulses of kindness and caring and good citizenship. Right? And Andrea Mulebach has argued, for instance, that in the case of Italy, neoliberalism has dissolved the difference between left and right through the articulation of a moral order rather than an uh, economic one. So humanitarianism is something that both the left and the right all agree on. Right? And it unites them within this kind of neoliberal citizenship. The power of such citizenship, humanitarianism, is visible when development as well as charity and missionary work and tourism, if you've heard of a term called a voluntourist, there are guidebooks published by Lonely Planet and a whole bunch of uh, guide, uh, you know, tourism guides that help you become, do volunteer work when you are a tourist. They're called voluntourism. They have, and you pay a lot of money to do that. <laughs> they have all become incorporated into a common kind of humanitarianism that unifies and homogenizes non-state welfare, works across public and private institutions, the state supports this in many ways, and creates ethical and effective belong, forms of belonging to an empire. I'm now going to shift to the third part, final part of my paper. In my research, I have tried to think about the work of empire and post-colonial difference, examining how empire produces particular kinds of differences against those emerging from other local and regional struggles. I'm going to come back to the binarism of tradition and modernity, along with that other binarisms of developed and underdeveloped, empire and periphery, all of which are kept alive even now by the practices that I have mentioned today. And by also the ways in which some scholars think of it in terms of frictions and complicities. One question I've been interested in is the use of terms that were mostly used for so-called traditional communities in the global south and that, seem, that were considered to be anachronistic for understanding the, the north. I want to think, and they were terms that were outsourced, and this is terms like uh, corruption and patriarchy are two of the ones I think today, right? And this was what I call outsourcing. These are terms that were most often used for other parts of the world and to ascribe failure to regions of the world, states in Africa, to their cultures and inhabitants, rather than to the financialization, globalization processes of colonialism and continued uh, expropriation in which they seem enmeshed. The concept of patriarchy, for instance, was often used only for cultures from Asia, Africa, and Middle East. And we need to think about this, bring back patriarchy to analyze North America. And you can see where I'm going with this, but not in a homogenizing way. It needs to contend with local hierarchies of race, class, religion, gender, sexuality, Right? But we need to think about how patriarchy can also describe modern cultures, so-called modern cultures. We need to think about this term, not through reducing everything to a patriarchy, right, as previous ideas of patriarchy did, but to think about patriarchy as a kind of hierarchy within hierarchies of power. Right? There were some people who were extremely powerful, other men not as powerful. So all kinds of groups of men and women are completely enmeshed in this in a variety of hierarchies. So 
We don't think of patriarchy as all men as being oppressed, oppressors and all women as being oppressed, right? So it's a much more complex uh, form of power, right? That creates numerous different kinds of hierarchies. It different, creates different kinds of forms of masculinities and femininities and also hetero and homo masculinities and femininities, right? The concept of patriarchy then, I want to think back Right? And use some of the ways in which feminist anthropologists have used it. Sylvia Yanagosaku more recently in talking about families, uh, firms in Italy, and you know, Michelle Rosaldo, who many decades ago also pioneered this work. So masculinities are not just about family, but about family as a network, a transnational one. The family and the patriarch, and one version of the patriarch is the oligarch. Right? One way in which we can understand what's happening in the US today in more transnational ways. Globally, these are patriarchs are not all white. I know, uh, I have heard of many in India too. Much as we can say comfortably say that in the US, they are mostly white. But we need to understand geopolitics, for instance, and the Trump regime as a patriarchy, trying to be an oligarchy, family members, and, this, and we must then think of the Trump administration as the ways in which a kind of traditional family firm captures the state, right? This is how uh, we need to understand the Trump organization and the way that it's becoming benefiting from the presidency. Family members have become state functionaries, and laws and regulations are used to benefit family and friends. And myriad forms of family, corporate, state linkages are created, many often hidden away that we don't even know about. The patriarch cares little about people or representation or democracy, but about his own power and about how to amass even greater wealth for his family firm. The Trump family, then, can be understood as a particular kind of capitalist family firm that is seen in many parts of the world. One might argue that Trumpism is best understood as a transnational network capitalist firm harnessing the power of racial empire in the US state. Such a patriarchal capitalism, seemingly outmoded in the West with the advent of the corporation as a collection of shareholding persons who may or may not have kinship ties, has long been a powerful formation, but few have examined it through the analysis of feminism and kinship. It has been enabled, as the economist Thomas Piketty has pointed out, by the tremendous power of inherited wealth transmitted within families towards the last decade of the 20th century and into the new century. Though Trump's family is not of many generations, his is still inherited wealth, as we discovered recently from the New York Times. Sylvia Yanagasako's research on such firms in Italy shed some light on how these operate and their gendered and patriarchal dimensions. And feminist anthropologists have called for greater attention to the use of kinship and gender in studying modern capitalist societies. The Trump family firm then, with all its advertising, use of media, desire to use the law for itself, is the main project of the Trump uh, presidency, and for which it uses racial population, all kinds of forms of power, for which it really cares very little to stay in power. Employing the children and family as key advisors, he doesn't trust anyone except his family, which is a very, char very characteristic of that family firm. He reveals how the American presidency has been captured, propelled by alliances with other capitalist networks, families. It's notable that many of Trump's travel seem to include visiting his own properties, and the American taxpayer then reimburses the Trump companies for his visits. Those visits include publicity for his properties from his house in Florida, which seem to be functioning both as presidential vacation spot owned by the Trump Corporation and as a hotel where businessmen and politicians around the world pay the Trump Hotel for access to the president. Trump Jr. used his position as the son of the president to create business opportunities in his visit to India, for instance. While these travels and deals are noted as corrupt by watchdog organizations in the US, it is notable that there is little done by Congress or other branches of the government to put an end to it. 
right? The Republican Party's refusal to disclose the Trump Corporation and his tax filings, and the extent of the holdings and finances of this privately held firm means that they have ceded the presidency to the family firm. The work of the presidency is thus to increase the profits of the Trump Organization. It requires this regime then, requires us to use a set of terms that Western scholars have most often used for the global south. The vocabulary of corruption, of patriarchy, oligarchy, seem very suited to the kinds of power being exercised in the US today. So in this, and I will just you know, say in passing, sexual power is also very much a part of this kind of uh, operation of the patriarch as well. And, and Trump is, of course, very well known for that kind uh, of uh, form of uh, use of corruption. And in, in other work, I think of corruption as including um, sexual access to all kinds of bodies, right, which is very uh, uh, visible in Trump. The kind of more recent uh, work, uh, the Me Too movement, for instance, the uh, information we've learned about Harvey Weinstein, et cetera, has also been very telling because that organization also used his brother as part of that organization to support the decades of predation, sexual predation that Harvey Weinstein used. Right. So this kind of way in which um, uh, the power of the, of the patriarchy is protected is also part of the securitization process. And I just, you know, in a longer article I work on, I'm working on, I talk about this, but you can see how the Israeli security company, Black Cube, was mobilized and used by Trump's, uh, by Harvey Weinstein lawyers to spy on the women who were reporting on him. So Rose McGowan, who was one of his victims, was, um, uh, was spied on by one of these operatives who came to her, who tried to appear as a feminist and sympathetic to her to find out what her legal strategy, et cetera, was, so they could fight her in the courts. So this kind of securitization of and the predation of the powerful subtends kind of is the foundation of many processes that protect patriarchy. Often these doors enter the courts or the legislative process, which prevents women and men, for instance, suffering these sexual assaults from going to the police, right? So how do we work against and protect, protest these malignant forms of power? One method used around the world has been to call for transparency, to expose corruption. And this has propelled many, many politics, uh, political parties in many parts of the world, right? Adjudication of corruption has been a mainstay of political organizing, which is why I think it's not such a useful term because it mobilizes people, but it mobilizes around mainly economic concerns rather than the concerns that I'm raising, the ways in which patriarchies use sexual assaults, access to women's bodies, all kinds of uh, you know, unsavory methods to protect themselves and their, their uh, family companies. Right. So in the Global South, corruption, often a very small retail variety, had became the mark of failed democracy and development. But how do we think of corruption in the US today in a similar way? Needless to say, in this kind of US empire, corruption of the Trump regime is often seen as the kind of end of the, of the kind of decline of the empire, as many people are calling it. Right. So I'm not very, uh, uh, of the opinion that corruption is, is itself a useful term to work with, right? Because it leaves out all of these varieties of network forms of power, gendered power, that are uh, part of the ways in which these powerful patriarchies are kept alive, right? So the exclusions of these term, corruption, are instructive. The advantages of upper class white male privilege of this kind of patriarchy with power of others and the ability to exert violence over others are highly desirable to many and often well known. 
but they are not local and, nas and national only. They include transnationally connected elites, you know, the Israeli defense company that comes and helps Harvey Weinstein. All of these networks are really important for us to understand, right? Marriage alliances, family networks that create this kind of power of, of these patriarchs. But our protests are important. I'm very much for these kinds of protests. The Me Too movement has one thing it has done for all its flaws. It's shown the entanglements of corporate and patriarchal power and presidential power. A capitalist patriarchy is protected by security states, extra legal machinations of complicit companies, offshore shelters, media corporations. The predations are then networked into the infrastructures of patriarchy and empire, security experts, geopolitics, and racism. And this kind of this common, this entanglements of all these make up what we call the security state. So I want to end by returning to some of the questions that I'm asked when I did my book, Saving the Security State. I said, you know, people ask me, you critique humanitarianism, you critique development, you critique protection. What are we going to do? What should we do? What is the answer to this? So I belong, I, there are several important, I think, takeaways. While I focus on the harnessing of feminism and I talk about the ways in which empowerment feminists have become harnessed to the project of securitization, the state, and all these uh, ways in which the, the mother, the parent controlling the children's surveillance becomes operationalized, uh, all of these are, are important. But we need to think about feminism in other ways as well, right? We need to think about feminism as advocacy for the rights of others, as advocacy for allowing people to inhabit and live in places where they can survive, regardless of whether they are citizens or not, right? So I think we need to think of emergent forms of feminisms that are being imagined in very different ways, right? Secondly, we must and cannot participate in the project of surveillance of our children, our families, our you know, gender non-conforming persons, our neighborhoods, all of these. I'm very much against this kinds of creeping forms of surveillance enabled by all these technologies that are, at, that are on our fingertips. So my students often want to use these um, a software which tells them if any of their friends are around in the neighborhood, for instance, and they can hang out with them. So those also are part of the kinds of technologies that enable surveillance. Third, we need to think on advocacy and protest and make the state address the welfare needs of all inhabitants rather than on leaving it to social entrepreneurs or to individuals to do as they wish. And the anthropologist James Ferguson said long ago, he said, development, he said, is often an anti-politics machine. It reduces protests and struggles and produces projects that often do not address the conditions of uh, needs of people on the ground, right? I think this version of securitized humanitarianism may just be yet another anti-political machine, but it can be even a little worse than that. It can ex exacerbate racism and disregard people's sovereign right to be left alone or even to be mobile in order to survive. Thank you. <laughs>